is Alana Berg. And with me, as always, is Father Ian Van Heusen. How are you doing, Father? Doing well. Good to see everyone. So I don't have my, my good camera set up today. It's very disappointing, but um, we'll make do with my laptop. This was the original setup, right? Yep. Back in the day. Didn't, what did I use for my oh, I used the Blue Yeti. That's right. Yep. Which I just figured out how to use properly, by the way. I just was watching a video, like I know what those symbols now mean on it. So I'm like, oh, got oh. it. Well, got that's it. fine. Do you have little <laughs> symbols on yours? I can tell you what they mean. No, it's just like, here's a microphone. Okay. There's not like little adjusting volume things. No, but yeah, it's okay. I've been learning about audio engineer. That's what I do in my free time. I listen to like videos of audio engineering and video stuff. And yeah, yeah it's like a hobby. It's okay great. to nerd out on that. It's all right. You know, yeah, it, it helps my job. That's right. Um, I'm going to so, be one step ahead, right? Or at least trying okay. to catch up. Exactly. So, all right. Well, how are you well, doing? Everything good? Uh, the, yeah, things are going well. Um, semester is pretty much over. We have one Wednesday dinner, um, Wednesday dinner, and then Sunday mass. And then I'm on vacation for a week with, uh, I'm going to be in with family and I'm excited. Yay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so. I walked like two miles with my dog this morning. I feel great. I'm yeah. That's the weather. Great. Yeah. So how, how things going with the homeschooling world? Good. Pretty good. Next we have this week and then next week is a break. We also get to take a little bit of a vacation and, um, stay staycation i guess yeah. <laughs> with our you know within our own family so we're doing good we're we're just hanging out and doing our thing we've really blessed to be able to not be affected by most things going around so yeah doing cool. good you cool. ready yeah let's jump in all right first readings from ezekiel ezekiel thus says the lord god I myself will look after and tend my sheep as a shepherd tends his flock. When the, he finds himself among his scattered sheep, so will I tend my sheep. I will rescue them from every place where they were scattered. When it was cloudy and dark, I myself will pasture my sheep. I myself will give them rest, says the Lord God. The lost I will seek out, the strayed I will bring back. The injured I will bind up, the sick I will heal, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy, shepherding them rightly. As for you, my sheep, says the Lord God, I will judge between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. Okay. So yeah. Ezekiel is kind of overlaps a little bit with Jeremiah. Uh, yeah. they have similar i wonder yeah so so that that sleek and strong thing the sleek and the strong destroying them of course obviously that seems like counterintuitive at first so there's a few possibilities i think i was just thinking about this this is an initial brainstorm i would not like quote me in a research paper do not say to like if you're in a class other than said this but i wonder if there's something about sleek and strong if maybe it was idiomatic maybe it was something like stubborn a sheep like like that there's sheep who, who um, stray from the flock who are, who are kind of independent. Cause like mm -hmm. you think about that when you're breeding animals, right? Like if right. you have, I mean, back in the day, I'm sure, especially back then, if you had a dog, for example, that was really independent minded, you probably wouldn't breed them. Right. You probably, you breed the more docile. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I wonder if that, that's just an initial height. Cause I mean, sometimes it can seem like a scriptural text, like is counterintuitive, and, I, and when I was younger, I used to always jump to that conclusion that it was like somewhat more mystical, which I think, I think also works. Um, I mean, I think both readings would work either way. Um, like a when I say mystical reading is that sense of um, the blind and the poor and the lowly are the ones that God exalts because they're receptive to his grace. Whereas the street, the sleek and the strong are those who, who, who in their thoughts and in their inner life think that they don't need God. And that would mm -hmm. be a, that'd be kind of one way of reading it. So I actually, both of them would kind of complement each other. So, but. so in a different, um, in, in my, a different version, it says, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the crippled and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will watch over. 
I will feed them in justice. So that's different. Huh. Yeah, we'd have to look at the different translations. I don't I don't mm-hmm. I don't know Hebrew or Greek that well. I mean right. at one point I did so, take Greek classes. I never took Hebrew. Though I would argue what 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 were you taught when you're at the Augusta Institute? Did they did they did they teach that the 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 the, the, the you should use the Hebrew or the Greek in the um, Old Testament? You should look at both and see in the language in our language how they worded everything. Yeah. Because, because um, you know, that was a debate. The uh, early Christians, um, Jesus himself seemed to quote more the Septuagint, which mm-hmm. is the Greek version. For those of you who don't know, the Septuagint is a famous version of the Old Testament that was translated into Greek. And the story goes uh, that there was a hundred, something like a hundred translations made simultaneously by the rabbis, I believe in Alexandria, into Greek. And when they compared all of the translations, they were exactly the same. So in the mind of Jews of Christ, of, of Jesus's time, the Septuagint almost had kind of like a divine character to it. It was considered almost as sacred as the Hebrew text. Mm-hmm. Now, the Hebrew text that we have right now that we base our he- the translations from Hebrew to English off of were actually done by Jews after the time of Jesus, which becomes very problematic because they were also very anti-Christian. So that's yeah. kind of the history of Bible translation 101. Yeah. And also in terms of having the, the Gentiles understand and be converted, it, w- it would be easier to use Septuagint um, yeah. in terms of language in that time. Yeah. Um, but there are, there, are, there are people who fiercely defend the idea that the Septuagint is the best version of the Old Testament. Yeah. The Septuagint and the Vulgate. The Vulgate's a little bit more. That's more traditional circles. Right. Yeah. Which is the, the Vulgate's the Latin translation. Right, right, which had to be translated from something. Um, right. So, but yes, uh, Septuagint is highly that, important and needs to be, you know, referenced. But yeah, I think when we come talk about the sleek and the strong, or the sleek and the fat, and and if they if they're destroyed or watched over, or you know, whatever that, whichever one we're supposed to really focus well, well, on. What was the, so we're reading from the New American Bible. Do you have the RSV? The, yeah, this is RSV Second Catholic Edition. The one you just looked up. Mm-hmm. Huh. So. That's weird. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's so. Yeah, so it's hard to it's hard to say. Definitive. Okay, the Hebrew is destroyed. Okay. It says the Hebrew is destroyed. Oh. So, so why the, do they not translate it that way? Because they just weren't comfortable with it. Maybe the Greek is trans- translated different. Yeah, gotcha. So, um, yeah. So, what's the? I mean, I think. I mean, I think the. I mean, I think the, the. The interesting thing is just this idea that those who are lowly will be exalted; those mm-hmm. who are exalted will be brought low. The and first will be last. The last will be first. And we it's can like see the this classic in reversal. Yeah, the classic. And we can reversal. see this in in Christ and how and how Christ really does. Um, bring back the strays and bind up the injured and heal the sick and really bring down those who are strong in their, what they think their faith is. Mm -hmm. And I think we all should, we should, you know, be wary and mindful of how we feel about our own (laughs) opinions and things and like, make sure to check them with, with scripture and with humility. Yeah. Well, you also, what's a classic thing. See, this is a spiritual direction thing. And uh, it's, I come across this more often than you would think, because you think people have been hearing this their whole life and they wouldn't say these kinds of things, but I will hear all the time. People were like, father, I lived a good life. I followed all the rules. Why X, Y, and Z, why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering? I've done all the right things. And you're kind of like, I think you need to go back and read your Bible a little bit. I mean, you don't say that. You, know, you kind of kind of walk them through and you know, you, you help them to identify with Christ and his crucifixion. But if you if you're attuned to the scriptures, this idea that God owes me this because I've lived a good life mm-hmm. is profoundly unbiblical. Right. And that yeah. And it's that's also a- extremely easy to fall into. So it's while you you probably see it often. It's probably because it's an easy thing to, to convince yourself of yeah. um, because even, even ones who, who are living rightly and, 
and are you know really mm -hmm. pious and everything like even they can they can be like okay well i've done all these things i've followed all the rules you know mm -hmm. why are my children falling falling away that's a huge issue for people who lose their faith like who are really 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 faithful and then something happens with their children and then they leave the faith yeah that is a that's a tough challenge i was i was actually counseling somebody whose um child somebody who i'm very close to by the way this was somebody who like i'm i've worked with for years we have a deep friendship outside of spiritual direction in spiritual direction it's a very very good relationship and one of their kids was just struggling with a lot and i said to him i said very honestly i said how are you dealing with the notion? I think it's very hard. And I would not normally say this to a parent, but a lot of times parents view their children as an extension of themselves, right? So when their kids are, when kids are going stray and the same thing we do with our parents, right? Why does it bother you when your parents have serious flaws? It's in a certain sense because you're projecting yourself onto them, right? So, so I, I asked him about this and, and he, we talked about it a little bit. I mean, he felt like he'd, he'd worked through some of that. That is a tough thing with parents when your when your kids are have serious problems. You're it's kind of like how do I screw them up kind of thing, um, which is, it, is I think. But see, this is also one of the things. Actually, listening to this, I just realized in my own life, and I, I might mention my next confession. There was a few ways that I fell into that thought trap, but I hadn't really thought of it that way until just now. I was like, oh wait a minute, I did that too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to bring it up, but but it's it, it, that's the beauty also of meditating constantly on these things. So I recently had an experience um, where the, the, the scripture really illuminated something in my heart. I, I was, I was, I, I heard this phrase, I rejoice to see the downfall of my foes. I was just thinking about it because of something that happened. Hopefully I'm not revealing too much. And, um, and when I was thinking about it, I looked up in scripture, I did a Google search. That's how I do a lot of things. And, um, and actually the biblical verse is the opposite. Do not rejoice in the downfall of your foes from Proverbs. I was like, I'll be danged, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, the but Psalms is that? No, is I, that, I couldn't uh, find anywhere. I couldn't find anywhere oh. in the Bible that says that. I mean, maybe it is. And maybe just my Google search is not finding it. Mm. Mm. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say um, in terms of feeling like your children are an extension of you. So mm. I totally understand this concept as a mother um so i would like to expound on that slightly um because it's not just in our heads it's in our culture to look at someone look at a child and say what is their flaws and how can we blame not the child not responsibility for own, one's own actions but the situation that they grew up in or what they were, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. how they were formed and, and then blame the parents. So it's, so it's ingrained in us as a culture to look somewhere, look at a person yeah. and then look somewhere else for the flaws. Yeah. We're doing this across the board in our culture. Yeah. And while sometimes that's true, personal responsibility is still what we're judged on, which what we will see in, in the gospel, right? Yeah. Like the personal responsibility and that God will be the judge, not the culture, not someone else. God, he says here, even I will judge between one sheep and another. God will judge. And it, yeah. we bring it upon ourselves. We say, I will judge between, you know, what's happening in this situation and who the blame should go to, but it's never the person that they're looking at, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem that we see lived out in our culture right now. Absolutely. And I, and I think, uh, yeah. So I think, um, and what, what people tend to argue, right. Is the classic liberals, it's all society's fault. You got to fix the system conservative. It's all the individual's responsibility, classic mm -hmm. kind of tension. And I mean, I think th there is a question. It is there. There are times when if you're working with somebody, it's almost a little bit of a myth. It's like the classic myth that you tell children that they can be anything they want to be, right? When you and I know I was never going to be an NBA player, not in a million years, mm -hmm. no matter how much I practiced, just didn't have it. Mm -hmm. um, but you tell your kids they can be anything they want to be. And I think there is something that we have to tell people. When you're working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they have to believe that everything is within their power. 
to change, to grow. Like you have to assume that this person is called to grow and this person is called to, to change, to, to change in a positive way, Mm -hmm. to change in a positive way. You just, you have to believe that. And, and, and now that being said, there is some truth in, there are some people that are so broken or so that, that have so many issues that they may never be normal, but it's like, you can't, if somebody internalizes that, like I'm broken, I will never get better. Mm-hmm. These things are beyond my control. Then that's what will be true. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that they guarantees will live out that. Yes, exactly. It guarantees that they, I mean, if you convince people now there is something when you do in counseling, which is, I mean, you can hear it. Uh, you know, the, uh, as I've said, I've said this before, the, um, the voice with which a parent speaks to their child becomes the voice with which they speak to themselves and the voice with which they understand scripture and the voice with which they hear God. Right. Hmm. So that, that terrifies me more than <laughs> anything else. Just let you know, like you're pushing on my insecurities. right now. <laughs> but, but it, it's, but it, but it's the voice you're speaking with right now. I mean, it's unless Man, I don't believe you're dramatically different with your family. Um, it's, but see, here's the thing is some people, because I've said it, I, I've, I've, I've encountered this before in counseling, spiritual direction, sp- spiritual counseling. I mean, it's kind of weird. I probably play a little bit with the line. I'm kind of almost like do counseling, but I mean, I, it works well. I mean, I, t- I mean, people don't, people don't come to me because they think I'm a professional counselor, but I do a lot of one-on-one stuff. So um, uh, the thing is, is I think there's a lot of people who have a hard time understanding scripture because they've never encountered certain principles in their parents in a balanced way. Um, I, I think it's good for parents to discipline and punish their kids. And when it makes sense and it's consistent and it's fair, even if it's a little bit ugly and a little bit harsh at times, if, if, if it's just that, that's like more what you're going for. Cause so then when they read, you know, this idea of pu- God punishing the sleek and the strong, they don't see it as an abusive father in the sky. They see it as, oh, that's what my parents did. And it made perfect sense. Yeah. When I was stubborn. So, so you saying that again with all of this context, to me as a parent thinks willful. The willful yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it's, a, it's a tough thing because, I mean, as a parent, it's a d- delicate balance because they talk about a lot. You have to be careful. You can't break your kid's will. But that, it's a challenge because, I mean, I'm sure – I, I, mean, I, I mean, my sister is that person. She has like incredibly strong will. Willful. Um, will. And I think it's more th- what I'm striving for is, is the balance of when do you celebrate their strength and when, and when do you discipline, you know, with their strength. <laughs> so without, because, because it is easy right now to break their will. Yeah. Um, and that's not, that's, I'm, I'm very conscious about that particular, yeah. my, yeah. Will I mean, was, I, I, my will, my will is have broken. Counseling. I, I wish I could record. I mean, of course I can't record, but yeah. the, the sitting, sitting in the counseling, I mean, I've had in, in conversations with people where like they suffer injustice as a six-year-old and man, they're still pissed about it. <laughs> <for Yeah. me. laughs> yeah. but, but normally, normally it's in relationships though, where it's like, they can't talk to their parents. It's actually a lot more common sense than you think. Like, you know, when people say, Oh, I need to love my kids more. If you say you love your kids on a regular basis and you mean it, if you enjoy their company, you're already better than a majority of like the abusive family situations. I, I encounter people where they're like, I don't think my mom liked me as a person. She didn't want to be around me. And she never just delighted in being with me. Like they couldn't remember their mother ever being with them just comfortably. Same mm-hmm. with, or the, with their fathers and things like that. And there's all kinds of dysfunction. It's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it, once you see it enough, you're kind of like, and you're, you're encountering most people like, you know, yeah, I mean, you're screwing up your kids in small ways, but it's really not that big of a deal. <laughs> but I mean, my parents weren't perfect, and but I don't have like, I mean, I had things I had to work through, but it wasn't, it wasn't crippling. Like the people I work with sometimes it's very crippling. Mm -hmm. Like they have a parent who never once said they loved them and, or just in a, in a legitimate way, enjoyed their presence, enjoyed their company. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, and you probably don't do that. I mean, I'm sure you, you're probably going to, after this go be like, well, I work hard trying to 
you know, really search that out. Right. And, yeah. and. But here's a, here's is. a practice. Here's an easy thing as a parent. What do your kids, what are your kids interested in? And just ask them about it and care about what they're interested in. I don't yes. care what it is. Listen like, to the Pokemon talk. All you need to do is listen to the Pokemon talk and the Minecraft talk. And as, and the, I mean, as I mean, much as you really... just want to like stab yourself in the brain, um, the, they will talk to you then about the hard things later because yeah, exactly. they listen to them then. So like, that's where I'm at right now. It's just like, I'm listening to Pokemon. <laughs> well, and, and, and take it a step up, actually care about Pokemon, learn about right. Pokemon, right. you know, research Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> that that's going to be. Uh, I'll have to. I'm going to throw this away. If I'm ever doing <laughs> confession with some parents, like, what are your kids like? If you're there struggling with their parents, I, I haven't had. I actually haven't had a lot of parents that are really struggling with their kids in a while. Um, I haven't had that in a while. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, like, I'm learning so much more because they're. I'm I'm teaching them and they're home. Yeah. Um things that we hadn't like my daughter is so smart and willful yeah. mm -hmm. and like doesn't listen to anything I say mm -hmm. um but turns out she processes things ver visually and kinetically but not audio like not through audio at all okay so it's like my life makes sense now because if I write it down she'll, she's fine like she'll do all the things if I write it down oh well, well, does she just get overwhelmed if you're saying it out loud just like one ear out the other like yeah like she's like yes i heard you but it like doesn't stick so that's it well but that, it's even like that with adults right i mean this is where you have the classic um and you learn their strengths and you learn how they do things and then you're like oh okay and then you have i mean i'm coping I'm, skills for other ways you know like, I mean, i'm scat i mean i'm just as scatterbrained as a, a sixth grader the difference is, is i have like people around me that remind me <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so <laughs> i mean so, i mean I, I have every day of like people like oh hey father are you gonna work on this i hope totally forgot <laughs> yes i will now if i was yeah. a sixth grader, they'd be like how'd you how dare you forget like if it was my mom how dare you forget right right and the, and funny how we have those standards for them but not for ourselves and that's something i also have to check myself on because then it's like oh what are you 11 oh okay you don't have a fully formed frontal cortex and you need <laughs> to rely on me. That's, oh, that's how this works. <laughs> and I think parents really struggle with that. Like they should know this. I say this every day. It's like, yeah. they don't know. And if they learn well, in different you, ways, you, you, you need be, to do it. I think it's also funny is to tell story, like to, to recognize stories of flourishing. One of the funniest stories that I've, my sister loves telling stories about General Honore. Um, getting into leadership and he was the most scatterbrained like guy. I mean, she didn't put it that way, but um, he had a, he had a, he had like a Lieutenant that would follow him around because he wouldn't remember anything. He would tell people you're going to get a, an award and the, it, the Lieutenant had to write it down and follow up with it. He would just talk off the top of his head, but he yeah. built a system around him. And apparently his emails were hilarious. Here he is. Like he's a general general honore. He's from Louisiana and his emails would start off, hey, what's up, cuz? <laughs> and it, like all, it was like all misspelled, like, what's up, cuz? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. I wish, I, I wish, wish she, I mean, he's doing great things now in his retirement too, but I might not completely agree with his politics, but that's another issue. A um, good leadership really knows how to surround themselves with people who really fill in those gaps. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that humility in knowing where you are not strong and putting someone there. And then bring it back to the reading, the sleek and mm -hmm. the strong. That's it. It never, it boggles my mind. The incompetency of, of arrogant people, arrogant and proud people who think they have it all figured out and they're just not willing to ask. Cause I mean, it's funny. I'm, I'm closing, getting close to 40 and now there's a point where I, I, there's a lot of things that I know how to do. And a lot of things that I have very strong competencies, especially with media stuff and things like that. And you'll be surprised. Like people will, they just won't reach out and ask me 
to help. Like, and I love to help with things. You'd be surprised how many times where people will spend 40 hours trying to figure out something that I could call up somebody and get an answer in like five minutes. But it's like, it's just pride and arrogance. It's just like, it's mind boggling. I would say also fear. Yeah. Pride, arrogance slash fear. (laughs) Yeah. But I have a surprise for you. There's a comment? Yes. Oh, who commented? Sorry. Yeah, we haven't had a comment in a while. Sorry, guys. We've been, it's just, it's just, everything's the craziness the past month. I know. Yeah. And also we've had technical difficulties on and off the last month, few yeah. months. So I'm excited to say Ryan Fisher is back. Ryan, what's <laughs> up, man? And you're, he's in the new app too. By the way, people are watching. We're doing a new app uh, Mighty on uh, Mighty Networks. Alana's on it and Ryan is as well. And um, yeah. yeah. Um. So let me, he gave us a few chats so i'm just gonna read them to you he says hello gang off facebook hiatus cleanse and glad to be here he says vacations what are those uh like what you took from facebook it's a good it's a good i'm also on a facebook cleanse right now so and and it's like being off of facebook but i'm just off of everything with everybody now actually (laughs) except for the healthy minds um okay Not sure if we still play bingo, but we had a sports reference and father has entered his name into the NBA draft. Yes. Um, I always like to remind my boys it's about progression and not perfection. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, the, he says, just realized I was commenting on father Ian's feed. Not sure if you've seen this. Hello, gang office. Oh, so he we'll switched over to Catholic. On both. Yeah. yeah. We've got a cool thing now where we can look at all the comments simultaneously. I know we're on restream. Restream. So I don't even have to go on Facebook to read the Facebook comments. This is like the best thing ever. Oh, you're not even, yeah, you're not on social media at all. You're just on Zoom and restream. So this is weird. We're talking to you on social media, but we are not there with you. I know, but we can respond, which is We can respond. But anyways, so Ryan, we are so happy to see you back. Anybody else who wants to be a regular and chat with us, we obviously are happy to see regular um names and faces and um just yeah. it just really well, we haven't heard my... well, there's a few people we haven't heard from in a while like norma we haven't heard from her in a while and yeah. then um who else there's, yeah ah, there's, there's a few there's of those a few people uh he says "Ooh, y'all are moving up bishop baron step aside <laughs> got a little while, way to go for that yeah but we got we got yeah I, yeah a little we bit, don't want to yeah. we don't want to get that high we just we want to be you know just i mean level I, I'm, of, I'm, I mean, I could, I, I, I would love to have an eight million dollar um, budget. <laughs> eight you know, million dollars. Like that sounds stressful. I'd rather just talk to you and be in a, in. Oh, I know. If, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I like, I like the stress though. I mean, yeah. I, like, crazy. I like. Yeah, I am crazy. <laughs> um, I like it. Crazy that we like. <laughs> um, so crazy that I talk to you once a week. At exactly. Least. Um. Okay. So we're at. With the half an hour mark. And I'm going to roll on to the second reading. So second reading, let's jump in. From 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead came also through man. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life. But each one in proper order Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When everything is subject to subjected to him, then his son himself, then the son himself will all also be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Okay. Yeah. That's an intense one. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, the, yeah, the demon of self-reliance, the, um, uh, the, 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 the God overthrows the, the temporal powers of this world. He's the strongest source of, Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And those who are in Christ, when he comes, will be brought, will be brought to him. Yeah. 
brought to life. By the way, this is a good time to mention, um, I'm reading Dare We Hope That All Men Be Saved by Von Balthasar, mm -hmm. and um, I disagree with it. Um, I, I, I'm having a hard time because my homeboy Ratzinger is quoted in it, and one of the, the there's a few different views that they take. Um, one is that um, that is a, Ratzinger and Von Balthasar takes um, is that God does not punish sins, but that punishes are found within sins themselves. So we punish ourselves at the, the second coming and at the final judgment, the particular judgment. Now I'm going to say why I disagree with this. Okay. Um, so one of the, the key principles, and I got to find a way of expressing this with some kind of concept, but the, the concept, I mean, I've got the language of the concept, but I want to think of a, a short phrase. I think I, and within the church fathers, I think the church fathers have talked about this. Everything that is good in God, everything that is good, true, and beautiful in God, it reflects or it shows us what is good, true, and beautiful in us. So if we say that God is so good and so loving that he doesn't punish, then when we punish, it implies a defect in us. And it would actually, it would seem to suggest that our perfection, if we are perfect in love, we would not punish anybody. But then we cannot, then, then judges can't be perfect. Police officers can't be perfect. Um, and when we say Christian perfection, we mean perfect in love and charity. And in a certain sense, receiving God's mercy. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, on our own efforts. But I think, I think when we imagine God as being punishing, then we can imagine our parents punishing in a reasonable and fair way. That's kind of, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Does okay. that make sense? I think, I think it's almost like he, it's because the ideal for which you strive communicates what you should be in the moment. So if your ideal is that God does not punish because he's pure love, then when I punish, I'm not loving. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I'm reading is the sinner's guide. And uh -oh. it's behind me. I don't remember exactly. Who? What, what, what year was it? Is that the way oh, that's the, that's pre Vatican too. Oh yes. Yes. So that they would definitely believe God punishes sins. Okay. But, but it, God punishes sins like we can't look straight at God because he's pure you know, goodness. So yeah. like we can't look at the sun because it blinds us. Yeah. So God's love is what the punishment is because we can't, because our, the imperfections. So he argues, he argues that God doesn't punish sins. No, the punishment comes from God's love. That's yeah. also that's also well, it's all, in divine comedy. The, the, yeah, the, the idea of the divine simplicity. But it's yeah. also it's also one of the one of the. There's no contradiction between his love and his justice. Basic. There's no. There's no. Right. It's just. It's the decision to sin and the decision not to repent is what cannot be um, with cannot be. Uh, I don't know what a good word is, but is painful when we encounter God's love and that's what the punishment is. So you're, you're getting closer to Ratzinger and Von Balthasar's view. That's, but that's so, so, okay, so I haven't read, read Von Balthasar, so I can't. Yeah. So I'd be curious. That. I'd be curious to, if you could pull but this. That's, but that's Dante's view. Um, so, I, so the first thing I said, the first about the sun I said is from the center's guy. Yeah, I, have to, I, have to, I have to look this up a little bit and, more. And so it's not I, that he doesn't, I, yeah. It's not that Aquinas, he doesn't I think, punish. It's just the punishment. Well, it's the question from, is, is the punishment extrinsic or intrinsic? So extrinsic is an external force acts upon you and punishes you. Intrinsic is you punish yourself. It is extrinsic. God it, is outside of you. His love is what, cre is what creates the yeah, pain that yeah. sin causes. So it's yeah. an extrinsic force, but it's still love. Yeah. So it's uh, just so, received so as Von something. Von and Ratzinger see the punishments of hell as more psychological and intrinsic and interior that you punish it yourself. Probably be both. Well, I, that's exactly. Of course, please don't. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I hate when you do that. <laughs> Every time I'm like, well, technically. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's mean, yes. It's the mean, right? The, it's the, the yes. middle is the virtue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make you crazy. No, 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 I don't. It, it, no, it is true. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> so, so it's just, I think, yeah. 
It's like, well, what are these people actually well, saying, well, and what do they actually mean? Well, I think and, what you're what you're, what you're getting at is is a kind of the the metaphysical the the. The, the the I think it's tied with the idea of the what's called the divine simplicity. So God does not have parts. There, there there's a, a there's mm-hmm. a radical simplicity to God. Right. It's um, kind of like how in the Gospels Christ has different effects on different people because of of their view of the world or whatever or but, their but, internal yeah, things. Agreed, but he does take a whip of cords and. and no, I guess, but that's not my point. My point yeah. is people respond differently because of their internal yeah. openness or, or hard, hard, hard hardness, right? Agreed. They respond Absolutely. differently. That's, Agreed. that's how. Exactly. It's that Christ loved everyone, you know, like his love was poured mm-hmm. up, out upon people. Some people didn't take it well. Gotcha. <laughs> That's yeah, to me similar a similar i i concept maybe not literally but in in my brain that it, it connects it makes sense it makes sense it makes perfect sense so again we get we get it we, i mean i think i, I think I, we got we're going to talk about this again because i think it's going to no, keep sure. coming up because punishment have, comes up constantly in the scriptures yeah. and that's where i mean I, uh, all right so ryan oh, is um, taking a break from from commenting um and i and i have other thoughts on this but yeah. There. We should we should bring Ryan into the video call sometime. Ryan, we have to we'll have to bring you in sometime. Yeah, we'll, we'll like we'll, we'll, we'll like we'll do a guest spot, like a, a five minute <laughs> guest spot. Or have you come in and call? What well, you do it on your phone but, or your laptop? But all right, so uh, okay, you ready for the gospel? Yep. Or you want to talk more about the sexual reading? No, I definitely want to go to the gospel. That's kind oh, of what okay. I was indicating. It, yeah. All right. <laughs> it's a long one too. <laughs> but here we go. Excuse me. <clears throat> From the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me. In prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he said, will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, in, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. A stranger and you gave me no welcome naked and you gave me no clothing ill and in prison you gave me and you did not care for me then they will answer and say lord when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs he will answer them amen i say to you what you did not do for one of these last ones you did not do for me and these will go off to eternal punishment but the but the righteous will to eternal life. Yeah. So, by the way, God punishes, right? He prepared hell. I mean, yeah. I, I I know that we could add all kinds of nuance and things like that, but that's the mm-hmm. problem is when we start to add that nuance, it's like, why why is it bad to just believe that God created hell? People go there. He judges you according to what you've done. He judges you by a pretty objective standard that's given. Like, why do we need to? Why do we need to complicate this? I mean, like, I mean, outside of the fact that, like, it doesn't sound like Taoism I think or something. Theologians complicate lots of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's and that's a, part of what we'll talk about at a different time. Well, maybe, maybe there maybe there is something about that. Like, it couldn't be that simple. Well, well why not? Like, right. And, <laughs> well, and it's not for. I don't think that conversation is for everyone. 
I think that conversation is for people who read those things and understand the foundation of the faith. And I think too many people who don't understand the foundation of the faith have an opinion about this. And I think that's dangerous. Yeah. I think I, and yeah, that's well, and by, where by the I way, stand for our listeners, that. this is like a whole thing with Dr. Taylor Marshall and Bishop Aaron. <laughs> so we're kind of jumping in, but um, and, see, and my I, stance, I, mean, I am sympathetic. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of von Balthasar, and I mean, I think the difference between like me and you and uh, and like Dr. Taylor Marshall and Church Militant is, I don't think Bishop Aaron's the Antichrist. Like, I think, I think he's honestly trying to be a good person and a good theologian. And and, and, and perhaps I think they have different navigating, audiences. yeah, and and perhaps navigating complex waters in his personal life. You know, I don't, I don't know, I can't speak to everything going on behind the scenes, but you know, it is tough when you're a priest and you're a member of the hierarchy. And even in my own way, is you have lots of connections and interactions with people, and on any given week or every given year, a good percentage of people you're interacting with and you're involved with are, are questionable. I mean. There are people in my diocese, there's people I work with, there's people I'm around that are just questionable. And uh, and it's and it's like the the weeds and the wheat, right? The 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 the, the wheat and the, the weeds. You know, you can't you gotta you gotta in a certain sense only be careful what you judge, careful jumping to conclusions. And you need to love them with the love of Christ. No, I'm, 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 I'm gonna go out I'm gonna go out on a limb here that um but I'm, willing, I'm willing to talk about it because we're 40 minutes in and only our really good fans are going to watch this point. But uh, <laughs> so these are people who care this about is, us deeply. This but, is the, I shouldn't say this, but I'm about to announcement. Th- th- it is. It is. <laughs> but yes, there are very clearly men in the priesthood with same sex attraction, whether they're active in the lifestyle or not. I, I think at this point, if, if you're shocked by that announcement, th- I hate to be the one to break it to you. Maybe, maybe you have, maybe you are kind of simple and like that's surprising to you. But for most people, I think we've realized, and and the challenge when you're a priest is like, I don't know why, but some people assume that if a priest is gay or liberal or some combination of the two, that they walk around just hating everybody. It's like, it's human relationships are more complex than that. Mm -hmm. Like there are priests of this diocese that, preach things that I don't think are in accord with the gospel, but guess what? We get along. Like that's, you know, like Mm -hmm. that might shock somebody, but like, I mean, I'm not the Bishop. I, I I don't have the role of correcting them. I sometimes, some of those people are very good at skirting the line so that they don't say things are outwardly heretical. And I don't know what the answer is for a Bishop. If I'm ever a Bishop, then I'll make those decisions. But until then I'm going to focus on being a priest and yeah, some of these guys you get along with. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you're, you're socialized with. And I'm going to connect us with, with the... And you don't know they're personalized, by the way. Like, I'm yeah. not aware of somebody right now who's in manifest mortal sin, who's doing things that they shouldn't, that I have firsthand knowledge that they're doing it, and I'm, I'm not calling them out on. Right. You, just, you just don't know. You don't know what people are doing in their personal lives. And in, in terms of the complexity of humans and relationships... I also think in terms of higher end theological complexities, um, Mm -hmm. we don't know all the things and it's a good conversation to dive into and to have and and to talk at that level. But when you try to like distill it into something that the masses can understand, it becomes something that, that's different to, to me. That's why I'm not wanting to join too much into who I agree with because mm. I don't agree that this is consumption for the masses that mm. I just disagree entirely with the fact that everyone needs to talk about it and everyone needs to have a freaking opinion on it. We will find <laughs> out when we get there, you know, like, is this necessary well, for your well, salvation? I, no. Well, um, you have everything needed. We don't need to. Con- you, we don't need to argue about. It. You know what I mean? I feel like this is so high level theology. Yeah. But this is this is the this is the way it's always been, though. I mean, right. there's a, they, these things have these things have popped up with the saints before. Somebody commenting? Um. Yep. Yeah. Who? Uh, Ryan says that this gospel is one of my favorite. I think uh, of this verse when 
often when helping the homeless or volunteering at the hospital. I also think of this a lot when the dom denominations questions Catholic and our view on the importance of works. Many of my Christian brothers think it's about faith and belief, so I often ask why then Jesus uses this parable to teach us the importance of works and our impending judgment and hope for salvation. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Let's shift the conversation a little bit. That I know. Way. I was like, "Thank you, Ryan, for bringing us back to the gospel. <laughs> this is why we well, need you." Well, okay. yes, yeah. I, I think, I think, yeah. It, um, um, and and now, yeah. one of my favorite, one of my favorite lines that Shap you loved to say, Archbishop Shap you. He, he loved to, whenever these passages came up, he said, serving the poor is not an option. If you do not serve the poor, you will go to hell. <laughs> he loved saying that. He, the, the, the priest would comment on that. It's like, yeah, he always yeah. loved he always, he always loved bringing up hell in the context of serving the poor. Now, not to say that everybody has to dedicate their lives to being a Mother Teresa, but if you're not doing anything for the poor, yes, that, that's a serious problem. So do you, okay, so I'm going to say something possibly controversial. Yeah, of course. Warning. A rare warning. Yeah. Um, when I was reading this just now, what came to me when he was talking about like that people, when I was hungry, you gave me no food. When I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. What was brought to my heart in during that was this lockdown and not receiving the sacraments and not receiving, receiving like support from the church. Yeah. Like that's what hit me. I was well, yeah, like, I mean, oh. you know, I, you know, I took the, I took the, I took the route that denying the sacraments. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it a little bit now because we're now fifty minutes in, and the chance at this point that anybody except our die hard fans are watching. Now, please, if you're a die hard fans, don't clip this and send it to the powers that be. I mean, you can. I'll still stand by what I said because I've said this publicly, and I'd be willing to say it again. I think now is a good time to talk about it because I, 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 I said during the lockdown then was not a good time to talk about it. I thought to defer to authority as much as possible and to do what you felt called to do was the best action, but to take a public stand, I did not think was appropriate. So I did, I do hold the position that denying the sacraments is grave matter, a mortal sin. I would say for sacrament for us ministers, if we're denying people confession, Eucharist could be somewhat debatable. Um, but I think with instruments we could give communion, um, but at least confession and anointing. There was enough allowance. Um, there's enough allowance in the tradition. You can anoint with a glove, full PPE. You can have a, a, you can have a 12 yard stick. You know, you can do whatever the heck. But you you figure it out and you, you get them the anointing and the confession. And you mm -hmm. can be 30 feet apart and hear somebody's confession. Um, so I felt that denying those sacraments in particular was a mortal sin. I, I did. I researched that during the lockdown, which informed my decisions. And yeah. Yeah. And I know that's that that's a very hard position that I, I don't think anybody else has said publicly um, for obvious reasons, I think, but I would, I would stand by it. Um, well, fear is, fear is a high motivator to not live your faith. Exactly. Which is why the fear of hell is, is so powerful. Cause if, if, if you're afraid, if you're more afraid of going to hell than you are of dying, I mean, cause that, that, that was, I mean, I, I, I said this, mm -hmm. hopefully, let me think how to put this. Um, my actions were informed by the, the reality that I would be held accountable by God. Right. And that no matter what, that that's the, that I could go to hell for my failure to act in these circumstances. I held that position mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I acted accordingly. Um, I mean, I, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to talk too much about what I've done. I've talked about it in bits and spurts with groups of people. Um, mm -hmm. I've tried not to talk about it too much. Um, but I felt that, um, certain actions were, were, were against my conscience. Yeah. We, we've talked about this at length. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. I'm being cryptic. Cause it really is. Okay. I'm trying to be respectful to authority and, you know, just trying to be respectful to authority. Cause I do, I mean, I do, um, I love my Bishop. I, I do love Pope Francis. Um, I, I, I do love our church leaders and our church. I want what's best for them. And um, I try to be a team player as much as possible. And, but there is a point where you have to remember that you're ultimately answerable to God. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, that's a, yeah. Yeah. So on that note, Ryan says, yes, Alana is getting controversial. I'm going to play the lottery. The moons are in alignment. <laughs> and then he says, can't offend me. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> so, but on that note, 
let us pray for our bishops because they are in a meeting. Yeah, they're doing a Zoom. They're doing yeah, the Zoom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's pray for them and let's pray for all of the victims and, of, and of those who are now being scandalized more by the McCarrick report. Um, and, you know, pray for our hearts to be docile. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, right, we have no- Wait. Mm-hmm. Christy Borton says, thank you for allowing our family to go to mass as just one family during the beginning of the pandemic. She just added oh. you. <laughs> Thanks, Chrissy. <laughs> yeah, you just out of me. <laughs> Shh. 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 Uh, that's all right. I and at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I can't get into it's the it. Underground yeah. church. <laughs> First fight uh, rule fight clubs. You don't talk about fight clubs. <laughs> Christy, you're not gonna get it again. You outed him. <laughs> all right. So okay. I, now let's now let's pray. So, so, and then Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just pray in a special way for our bishops. We ask that as they meet, you may illuminate their hearts, Lord. We know that that there's a mixture of good bishops, bad bishops, and different bishops. Strengthen, strengthen those bishops that are faithful. Heal the brokenhearted among the bishops and, and help the ones that are struggling to come to the place of conversion. We pray for ourselves, for our church. Um, the same with us. Help us to recognize our need for you. That as we meditate upon you, O Heavenly Father, and your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and how you guide and shepherd us, and you lead us, help us to be live an imitation of that in our own ways, in our own lives. We pray also for the victims of the McCarrick. We pray for all the controversies surrounding the McCarrick Report. In this dark hour, Lord, we know that you're raising up a generation of saints. Help us to look for moments of grace, to connect with your loving presence. We ask you to bless all who will watch or listen to this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.